Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next 15 minutes where we're going to be talking about Terraform. Um, my name is Natalie Godek. I am a staff cloud engineer at a digital healthcare scale up Babylon based in London, where I build data platforms. And you know, I've been a data ops slash system slash cloud engineer for a couple of years now. And there are a couple of ideas that keep coming back again and again in the discussions around new features. How do we manage our config? How do we manage our systems? And one of them is, if you can, it doesn't really mean that you should. One of the main ideas in my domain of work is to automate things, automate everything. That is shortly followed by abstract everything. We started with physical servers where we had to provision physical infrastructure and wait for like three months to get a server into place. Then came virtual machines that allowed us to automate provisioning of service and abstract the physical infrastructure with virtualization platforms. With that came configuration management. We added a layer of abstraction on top of virtualization platforms. Then came software defined everything. Now we have clouds that abstract completely the fact that there is even physical infrastructure anywhere or virtual servers, virtual machines. We have infrastructure as code that allow us to automate provisioning of cloud resources. We build pipelines around our Terraform to automate Terraform. We build CICD on top of pipelines to automate pipelines. And eventually, we try to like, expose an interface to our developers that is like, you can provision everything with three lines of YAML. So we build these layers upon layers upon layers of abstraction and automation. But where do we draw the line? Is it here? This is a very valid, very functional piece of Terraform that takes some sort of input and transforms it into a different kind of map. I particularly like the, the three dots down below. I call it black magic. Um, it gives me comfort in answering the question, oh, how does this work? With, I have no idea because the code suggests that it also has no idea? Or is this where we draw the line? Imagine debugging something in 2,000 resources. Eh. You will get dependency loops. You will get inconsistent states. And I personally, inconsistency in my infra is something that I really, really, really dislike. You will have people looking at your platforms and going, oh, I don't really understand how that works. I'm going to just go to my own corner and do my own thing. And eventually, you have out of that security holes because people don't necessarily know how to configure security properly. You, ha you will have all of these nightmares. But it's really easy to fall into them if you don't take into account certain lessons that exist in infrastructure management. It's really easy to say, hey, I'm going to develop a Terraform module. I'm going to add this use case to it. And now I'm going to add that use case to it. And I'm going to just have a conditional here and a conditional there. And before you know it, you have your module stuffed full of transformations and ifs and for loops. And you have all of the use cases and a kitchen sink in a single module. And if tomorrow you go away, the next person will have no idea how to maintain your module and maintain your code. And they will probably write something new and go full circle. There is also procedural flows. And this one is an interesting one, because what is Terraform? Terraform is a configuration language, which means that it is declarative. We are describing the desired end state of our infrastructure. We're not telling the system, hey, create me a compute instance with 8 gig of memory, attach that 8 gig of memory to the, to the virtual machine. No, we're saying, I would like a compute instance with 8 gig of memory and the system figures out where to go. Now, with new versions of Terraform and, uh, and the new releases, we have more and more functions, we have more and more operators and for loops and whatnot that allow for certain procedural flows. And it's really, really handy in most cases, but sometimes it can be a bit tricky and you can create something that is not exactly following the principles of a declarative language. There's also local execs, and I know that everybody hates local execs, and everybody has local execs in their Terraform. I'm sure all of you do. There are also pieces of infrastructure that don't necessarily lend themselves really easily into being in Terraform. One example of that is VPC peering. Yes, there are resources to manage that, but in AWS, you have to initiate the VPC peering in one AWS account in one VPC, 
go to the other AWS account, confirm the VPC peering there, wait for AWS to do its thing, and then finalize the whole procedure. You can do it, but is it easy? And does it really sound like an elegant solution? Depends. Another example is Kubernetes on the cloud, where you have to deploy one thing, then wait for that to finish, pick up the output, deploy another thing, maybe do some Ansible on the, on the nodes, maybe do some local execs, and wait for certain things to finish before you can start other things. Yes, you can do it, but you need to be really clever to not fall into a module or a component that is absolutely nightmarish to, to manage. And if someone else comes and says, oh, I'd like a Kubernetes cluster, your team goes, <laughs> put that on our roadmap and we'll get it to you maybe in three months. You know, it's terraform. It should be like click done. Mm -hmm. I need to copy that secret from Vault locally and, and do a terraform import. Mm. And of course, you can have all-in-one states, that 2000 state at the beginning that exists. And this is a particularly easy thing to fall into, especially when you're starting with infra infrastructure as code and managing your infra in code in Terraform. It's really easy to say, hey, I have a database module. I'm going to manage all of my databases in the same place. And that's cool if you have four. What if you have 400 in 10 environments? Mm. There you will have security holes, because somewhere, somewhere in those 2,000 resources and 400 databases, there will be someone who forgot to enable encryption. Or from the security perspective, it's quite convenient to say, I'm going to manage all of my policies in the same module, and everyone who needs a new IAM policy will have to release a new version of this module. That way, I have all of the policies in the same place centralized. Yay, security. A developer comes, looks at that module, and says, resource I am policy, no, 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 no. And they will do their own thing without you knowing, without conforming to any compliance and any standards that you have created. And of course, if you have, if you have to do a targeted deployment, like not because you're cutting a corner and you want to do something once and you know that it will work on, the, on, like on auto, an automated deployment, but if you have to do Terraform apply dash dash target and you know that without that, your deployment will fail, your code has to be rewritten. There's something wrong with it, there's something not functioning, and you're just creating pain for yourself and your team. And again, you will go away, and someone after you will come and be like, what is that? Happens all the time, right? So there are things also that you can take into account and do better. I suggest that you create, define a single point of deployment. What is a single point of deployment? Well, it might be all the infrastructure that is needed for a particular service. Let's say you have your little container app. It needs a database, it needs an IAM role, and it needs a Lambda function. Those things are the infrastructure that is needed for that little container app. That will be your single point of deployment. Or maybe you will want to group your resources that a particular team is using. For example, AI researchers need a bunch of compute instances with 42 GPUs, bless them, um, an IAM role, and maybe a Google Container Registry. And you might want to group them together into a single point of deployment, because that's all of the infra that that particular team is using. Also, you can have standalone, very complex pieces of infrastructure. For example, AWS OpenSearch, Elasticsearch on AWS, or Google Cloud Composer. On their own, they, they are just a, a cluster. It's a single deployment. However, they also need policies and roles and security configurations, security groups. They might need a Lambda function to configure the open search internals. They might need a cloud function to configure Airflow uh, connections. And loads and loads of things that, in order to have a functional deployment of open search or a functional Airflow cluster, you need all of those things. And they create a quite a big, like bulky, slow-moving system. And it makes sense to create a single point of deployment out of it. And in terms of characteristics of how do you identify these things, if you have a group of resources that lives together, it evolves together, it can be tested and deployed all together, but independently from the rest of your infrastructure, and that independence is variable, right? Your open search cluster will need a VPC, 
but you will have probably deployed a VPC separately anyway, and all of the rest of your resources use that. But other than that, like your group of resources will be independent from the rest of the infra. There will be no conflicts within this group of resources and no kind of dependency loops or issues. And you can like really have a life cycle on its own for this group of resources. This would be your single point of deployment. And it really makes your life easier because then somebody can own that point of deployment. And your, your team can just say, here, here you go, you manage it. And that other team, even they have no idea about how to manage infra or how to write Terraform, they, can, they know that this is theirs and they can take care of it because you've structured it well. And speaking of structuring things well, once you are setting yourself on the path of self-serviceable infrastructure, which you should, you need to define design patterns, guidelines, guard and guardrails. Why? Your design patterns will be well-defined, well-written, easy to understand docs and Terraform modules that are applicable to your particular system and to your particular platform. Once you have that, once you have the building blocks that are really, really easy to reuse and they're structured in the same manner, like all of your, your S3 bucket module is structured in the same way as your RDS module, as your composer module, and anyone can look at them and understand how they can be picked up and included in a single point of deployment, it will be easier for them to work with it. And I've done this in, like my team has done this in, in our organization and we have analysts writing Terraform. Analysts who do SQL and pretty graphs and work with Tableau and Looker and things that I have no idea about and write data science models. They also come and say, oh, hey, I'd like a, a web app. And I say, okay, here are the standards of how we do infrastructure. Let's, let's talk about it. And we talk about it. And they have written a Terraform module for a web app with some help, but they have done it mostly on their own. Then, of course, if you are giving developers and everybody the ability to deploy and develop their own things, you need some guidelines. You might want to say, hey, if you are creating an S3 bucket, please turn off public access and please turn on encryption. If you are creating a new subnet, please turn on flow logs. And if you are creating a new Google project, please include it into a folder so that audit logging is enabled for you automatically. You publish those guidelines as docs, again, clear, very well documented, easy to access, easy to search. And then guardrails are things that enforce those, those guidelines. You ha can have Chekhov and Terraform compliance in your CI CD to check your Terraform code for compliance with the guidelines. You can have GCP org policies, AWS config and Azure policy to enforce that, those security rules so that nobody can create an S3 bucket with public access. And have a system that is well-maintained, well-oiled, self-serviceable, but stays compliant and stays consistent. And to summarize all of it, there's my second favorite idea that comes back again and again, is KISS. Keep it simple. If you don't know, Google it. And in the words of Anton Babenka, who's just there, because I couldn't have said it better, always ask why, why you're doing something, why are you including black magic in your Terraform code, why do you have 2,000 resources, why are all of your databases in the same place? And rem remember understandability. You will go away eventually to a conference like I am right now, and someone will have to understand what you've written while you're away. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.